the G8700 is pretty much done. I just need to put the uh, lid and bottom back on it. But before I do that, let's give you the tour. As you can see, it's been cleaned. I have been, I had a video of what I do to clean these things. It's really, really simple. You just spray it down with some cleaner and, well, wait, and then brush it off with a, with a brush. It's really easy. Um, somebody had said, oh, the reason you haven't shown shown us what it looks like afterward is because you rubbed off the letters. No, silly. The reason I haven't shown you what the after looks like is because I haven't put that unit back together. I've been fixing everybody else's. You know, that prod the, uh, unfortunately, the realistic is pretty much backburnered at this point. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to be able to get to it. Work and school, you know. Anyway, you can see that it doesn't take the lettering off. It just takes all the dirt and 33 years of fingerprints off. Unfortunately, it doesn't take off 33 years worth of uh, minor scratches, but eh, whatever. It looks pretty good. It's really nice looking. It's, as you can see, it's so shiny that it's causing glare. It does a pretty good job of the uh, plastic, too. It doesn't etch the plastics or anything like that. Uh, overall, I would say the aluminum wheel cleaner is a success, and I'm going to keep using it as I have been for the last five years. Okay, circuitry-wise, this wasn't uh, too crazy. It was just very labor-intensive because the uh, receiver is so large and complicated. You have new caps on the frequency display and digital assist board. One new cap in the FM front end. Bunch of new caps on the AM and FM IF board. Ton of new caps on the Dolby board. Not that any, anybody uses Dolby FM, but we wouldn't want a uh, cap to explode. I did find a few of these small caps that were leaking. They weren't in the best of shape. And this unit has a history of running hot, so they needed to get gone. Um, this is the radio supply board, or the RF power board. These transistors here have new thermal compound, and of course the board has been checked for cold solder joints, and it has new capacitors. Most of them are Panasonic FC. Uh, more Panasonic FC caps on the master power board. Uh, if anybody's going to tackle this repair, a little warning about C616 down right down there the smaller the one of the smaller caps the marking on the PCB is backwards if you install it per the marking you will damage the capacitor and blow these two fuses so uh, don't trust the markings go slow and uh, you'll get it done speaking of bad markings the marking on the driver board for the transistor the 2SK97 dual in channel FET. The pinout is as follows DGS, not DSG. So if you're going to replace that with two discrete FETs because you can't find a 2SK97, you need to realize that that silk screen is wrong. Those do appear to be the only instances of incorrect silk screening aside from. A, uh, a marking that suggests that you need a uh, non-polarized cap somewhere on the phono board. I forgot what capacitors those were though. So go slow on that board as well. Again another Panasonic FC cap there and there. And new pots. These are multi-turn pots for better precision and adjustment. They also uh, prevent uh, the bias from going crazy and destroying the amplifier because the uh, pot went bad. Bunch of new transistors and all new caps on both of these boards. This one actually needed a new 2SK97. Um, when the output stage failed, it failed so spectacularly that the failure cascaded all the way back to the input. If you're replacing a 2SK97 with discrete FETs, you need to observe a few things. First off, of course, the new FETs must be of the same polarity. 
and must have equal or greater current and voltage ratings. You also need to watch the uh, pinch off voltage. If it's too high, you won't be able to uh, null the offset. The pinch off needs to be anywhere between 300 millivolts and 1.7 volts. So you need a pretty low pinch off small signal FET and you need a matched pair of them. You can match them in your own home using a curve tracer. Of course, most people won't do that at home. Most That's generally the domain of a professional repair shop. Although this is a professional repair shop run from a home. Bias is found, but the bias, uh, the voltage that develops the bias current is found between the emitters of TR2 and TR3 down there. You're going to be looking for 5 millivolts, just 5. That is not a misprint. Um, these receivers, unfortunately, do not have temperature compensated bias, and it is pretty easy to make them uh, blow up if the bias gets out of hand. These units are particularly, particularly susceptible to failures due to bias problems. Maybe some of you may be wondering, well, what are these two old caps still doing here? Well, they're, st they're still in the circuit because they're chassis mount caps. They tend to be sealed really well. They're measuring perfectly, and they're very expensive to replace. And since the uh, owner was already racking up quite a bill on this repair because of how much labor it is, um, he opted to leave them in, and there's really no problem in doing that. They're not bulging, they're not uh, leaking, and they're fine. So we're going to let them go. And they should last at least another decade. The same could not be said of the uh, smaller caps. They were having some problems. Uh, quite a few of them were leaking. And it's a good thing they're gone. Let's turn this guy over and I'll show you some more stuff. All new caps on the audio power board. The po power board on the other side is the RF power board. Again, new thermal compound on these little transistors here and that one there new caps, and all the cold solder joints have been taken care of. Ditto for the uh, protection board, all new caps there, no cold solder joints. All new caps on the uh, tone control board. You'll see those green ones are Nishikon Muse, you'll see I've snuck in some film caps, and the rest of them are Panasonic FC. There are a couple of Nishikon KLs where the where film was just going to be too big, uh, replacing the existing non-polarized electrolytics. I mean, low leakage electrolytics, excuse me. Non-polarized were of course replaced with Nishikon ES. A few new caps on our uh, microphone preamp and signal selection board, and of course all the uh, cold solder joints were touched up. Now let's go to the back of the amplifier, where you see the output transistors. You'll note they're all new. I'm using a combination of MJ21195 and 21196. Pretty much those are the state-of-the-art TO3 audio power transistors these days. Probably the last of the TO3s actually. You'll note there are a couple of Sharpie marks on each one. Those are gain match marks that I put on in the shop to uh, tell me which ones are matched pairs. You'll note that this one has two marks and that the other channel has one mark. That's so I don't get, get them mixed up and blow up the amplifier. They're all the same transistor, but of course, across all the uh, same batch of transistors, you'll have different gains, and you want to match these gains so each pair here and here you want to make sure they share current equally. Because if they don't, one of them, the stronger gain transistor, will take the uh, lion's share of the current and burn itself out. And since that's probably what this thing came in for in the first place, uh, one started eating too much current, we don't ha want to have that happen again. Uh, we want this receiver to last a very long time. Uh, there are some heat sinks that fit over these. Um, they're die cast aluminum. I'm going to put some thermal compound here, 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 here. 
and uh, slap them back on. But I thought I'd show you what they look like underneath. It's a pretty majestic beast. Um, push double push pull on both channels. It's quite a machine. It's 160 watts per channel at 0 0.025. No, 0 0.0025, I believe. No, it's 0 0.025, excuse me. I'm just looking at the sheet here. 0.025% THD. So it's pretty clean and it's very powerful. Um, aside from the uh, two little markings being wrong and this thing being picky about bias, that's really the only thing that you've got to watch out for in the Sansui. G9700 and G8700. The only difference, of course, is the 9700 is a 200 water, and this is a 160. Uh, they're the same otherwise. But that's really the only thing that's difficult about this unit. Uh, the rest of it is just time. There are so many boards to solder on, and there are so many caps. Um, that's the only reason these things are expensive to redo. This job here, if it wasn't for a friend, um, he's getting a special discount um, because he funnels a ton of business to Andrews Electronics. Uh, but this job is anywhere from 500 to 550. Uh, if you wanted those uh, two big caps there changed, you'd be looking at 600 to 625. Um, that sounds like a lot of money to repair or repair a receiver, but uh, keep in mind that is a full restoration of a receiver. Um, it, it literally works better than brand new. And you're not going to find that kind of power and this kind of performance for five to six hundred bucks new. So if you've got one of these things and it's ailing, you might as well send it in and get it fixed uh, because they're awesome. Anyway, I'm going to uh, button this guy back up and do a load test. I was going to see if it really does 160 watts or if I can coax just a little bit more out of it.